Aluminium is literally one of the most common elements on Earth. So how did it come to be that aluminium once cost more than gold? Was it similar to how the relatively common and easily acquired mined diamond came to be seen as valuable in the last century due to strict control of supply to consumers and some of the best marketing the world has ever seen? Well, the simple answer is that although aluminium makes up about 8% of the Earth's crust, it has never been known to occur in its metallic form anywhere on Earth. Instead, aluminium appears mainly as a chemical compound across the globe, for example, inside potassium aluminium sulfate. Before aluminium was discovered or even theorized, so called alum compounds like potassium aluminium sulfate have been used extensively since antiquity for everything from leather tanning to fireproofing. In fact, potassium aluminium sulfate, colloquially known as potassium alum, is used today in things like aftershave and baking powder, and most awesomely of all, its crystal state can be used as a deodorant rock that you rub on yourself to eliminate body odor. Now, at first glance, it would seem like these chemical compounds are referred to as alum because they contain aluminium, but this isn't actually the case. The word alum is a colloquial name given to a wide range of compounds that don't necessarily contain aluminium, for example, chromium potassium sulfate, which is commonly shortened to chrome alum. The word aluminium itself is derivative of the word alum and not the other way around. It is commonly held that aluminium wasn't theorized to exist until around 1807 when a chemist, Sir Humphrey Davy, argued that alum was the salt of a yet undiscovered metal, a metal Davy wanted to call aluminium. However, there's some debate amongst the scientific community about whether Davy was truly the first person to make this leap, because 30 years prior, in 1778, the French chemist Antoine Lavoisier posited in his landmark book, Elements of Chemistry, that what he called argilla, aluminium oxide, could exist as a solid metal in theory, but the technology of the day couldn't separate the strongly bound oxygen atoms. In fact, argilla is tentatively listed as an actual element in Lavoisier's original draft of his table of elements. Whatever the case, aluminium was first isolated in a lab in 1825 by Hans Christian Orsted by heating aluminium chloride with potassium amalgam. In honor of Davy's work, which had inspired Orsted's experiment in the first place, this new metal was dubbed aluminium. The flecks of metal that Orsted produced using this method were so small and impure that a proper analysis of the metal was simply impossible. Two years later, Friedrich Wuhler entered the aluminium manufacturing scene and discovered a new way of isolating aluminium in its powdered form by improving upon Ørsted's original experiment. Even then, it took another 18 years for enough of the metal to be produced for scientists to properly study its properties, and it wasn't until 1845 that aluminium's remarkable lightness was finally noted. Nine years later, in 1854, Henry St. Clair de Ville developed a way of producing the metal on a much larger scale with the use of sodium, allowing, for the first time in history, kilograms of the metal to be produced at a time. For comparison's sake, it had taken Voller years to produce the same amount of aluminium that de Ville could produce in a single day. A year later, in 1855, 12 small ingots of aluminium were displayed at the Exposition Universale, a huge French exhibition organized at the bequest of French Emperor Napoleon III. Almost immediately after the exhibition, demands for this magical metal absolutely skyrocketed. Its shininess, combined with its almost ghostly lightness compared to other metals, made it an ideal metal for jewelry, and it wasn't long until the French elite were wearing brooches and buttons that were made of the metal. This passing fancy that the upper echelons of society had with aluminium infuriated Deville to no end because he felt that the metal had significant practical applications to benefit the masses, not just to be used as a curiosity and flaunted by the elite. One person who shared Deville's vision was Emperor Napoleon III himself, who granted Deville a virtually unlimited budget to study and produce the metal long before the exhibition. Napoleon had hoped that this new metal would be used to produce lightweight weapons and armor for his army. Although a few helmets were produced, the sheer cost of refining the metal shelved the plan indefinitely. Frustrated, Napoleon III had a supply of aluminium melted down and pressed into cutlery. The oft-repeated story goes that Napoleon III was rumored to have eaten off the aluminium plates, while his guests had to make do with ones that were made of gold. Whether that story is true or not, at this point, aluminium really was harder to get hold of than gold, and the price it reflected that. This is, of course, despite its prevalence in the Earth's crust compared to gold. All of that changed in 1886, when it was discovered twice that you could easily obtain oodles of aluminium using electrolysis. This discovery was made by Paul Luce to saint Hero and Charles Martin Hall at almost exactly the same time in both France and America, totally independent from one another. For this reason, the process which is still used today is referred to as the Hero Hall process in honor of both of them. Two years after this, it was discovered by Carl Bayer that aluminium oxide could be made very cheaply from bauxite. As a result of both of these things, the price of aluminium absolutely plummeted. In a few short years, aluminium went from being one of the most expensive metals on earth to the cheapest. For reference, in 18 
1952, before the Harrow Hall process, aluminium sold for upwards of $1,200 per kilo. But by the start of the 20th century, the same amount of aluminium cost under a dollar. So I really hope you liked that video. If you did, please give us a thumbs up below. Also, do not forget to subscribe. Why not check out another channel I do called Biographics? You'll find that linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.